Um, so I'm from uh, Space Doctors, and our aim really is to make uh, semiotics accessible um, for our clients. Um, and as semioticians, these uh, the nuanced, obsessed individuals that we are, we know that everything communicates and, and does so within context. And so did the late, great John Berger, who in the landmark uh, book and BBC TV series, Ways of Seeing, revealed the gender relations encoded in the Western artistic tradition. Uh, he made clear a hierarchy. Men act and women appear. Men look at women, women watch themselves being looked at. And through revealing this, he asked us to challenge it and find new ways of seeing. Similarly, there is a hierarchy encoded in the way that we think about our world and the way that we experience it through our senses. And over the next 14 minutes, uh, I would like to talk about the senses which brands often neglect. So this is um, a sort of diagram of the hierarchy of how we think about the senses typically, certainly in the West, uh, with vision at the top, um, the most refined sense. Um, it's often perceived in that way, followed by hearing. These two comprise the distant senses, um, followed by taste, uh, smell and touch at the bottom, the proximate senses, and the senses that often connect with, with uh, sort of baser elements or are seen as not being quite so refined as the senses at, at the top. We can think about how this is encoded in the words we used to describe um, great thinkers. We might, we might talk about a visionary or we might talk about someone who has a feeling. Um, I know who I would follow. And this ocular centrism, uh, many theorists have pointed out, uh, has kind of been with us since the beginnings of, of Greek thought and philosophy. Um, so Hannah Arendt here says, that from the very outset of formal philosophy, thinking has been thought of in terms of seeing. The predominance of sight is so deeply embedded in Greek speech that we seldom find any consideration bestowed upon it. Like any ideology, it feels natural and normal and kind of beyond questioning. We also live in a world which is more and more uh, digital, where we're distracted by these screens. Uh, there's more demands on our vision to the point where we might ask, is light still a metaphor for truth? We live in a world where we're so distracted that in China, there are now cell phone walking lanes to prevent people from stumbling into each other on the pavement or walking into the road. We're getting sucked into this flat virtual world and becoming disconnected from lived felt experience. But as always, the Hegelian pendulum always swings back. We're seeing an explosion in what we would call multisensorial experiences and brand activations. For example, um, Clinique here have matched lip color to music. Johnny Walker have created a glass which transmits audio to the uh, drinker and um, transforming their perceptions of taste. Um, and Ultraviolet in Shanghai takes the culinary experience far beyond the typical senses to become a truly immersive multisensorial experience. The science of sensory perception is moving out of the laboratory and into popular consciousness. And we believe culture needs to come along for the ride. The senses are carriers of meaning and receivers of signs. And through sensory semiotics, we can decode meaning into experience. And this is important because brands deliver the value and the meaning that they create through the sensory experiences they deliver. But they do so in a contaminated fashion, in a way that's contaminated and skewed by cultural context. So on our journey to creating a sensory semiotics offer for our clients, this has been a bit of a guiding light for us this thought of, as we sense, we make sense. Our senses aren't simply passive receivers of meaning. We actively construct that meaning um, as we receive it. And that's through a subjective lens, which is highly influenced by culture. So through sensory semiotics, we have a way of unlocking uh, kind of new ways to amplify meaning uh, through lived, felt experience. For example, if packaging feels soft, if it invites gentle gestures, then the brand itself will be perceived as gentle, caring, and safe. For us, it's about identifying core sensory cues um, that align with brand meaning and brand strategy and transmitting those to the consumer in a way that's understood and coherent across all sensory touch points. An example of how this has been done for quite some time in a successful way is found in the automotive industry, where the sound of a car door may as well have its own composer. Um, on a family saloon, you want that kind of deep, solid kathunk that reassures the consumer that this is a safe, reliable automobile. Um, whereas in a sports coupe, 
You want the kind of snappy sound of the door closing, which alerts you to the fact that this is a fast, agile car that's going to give you a thrilling experience. In both cases, the sonic experience is tallying with the kinesthetic closing of the door um, to give a holistic representation of what the experience of driving that car will be like. And there's strategic value in creating these sensory experiences that resonate powerfully with consumers. Research has shown that effectively stimulating the senses creates powerful memories and associations which drive brand recognition, uh, ritual, and brand preference. It's, always, it's also worth remembering um, that we're able to absorb a huge amount of information. We're able to take on a huge amount of cues. Um, so Phil Barden points out uh, via Daniel Kahneman um, the, uh, the massive capacity of the autopilot, of the system one brain to absorb cues. Um, potentially all the signals we send can increase the persuasiveness of our marketing activities. So everything must be taken into consideration by brands. And this brings us to one of the core aspects of commercial semiotics, which is that intended meaning does not always equal received meaning. When you're transmitting your message across multiple markets, multiple regions, and different creative agencies, design agencies, packaging agencies, various retail environments, various home environments, brand messages can become diluted, diluted or incoherent across these touch points. But commercial semiotics provides a central touchstone through which these various areas can kind of look at how meaning has been transformed into sensory cues, um, a central reference for all of these different nodes. So how do we materialize intention? How do we take brand strategy and change that into something which is lived and felt by consumers? Last year, we were approached by Smith & Sinclair. They're a, um, a startup that make these cocktail pastilles. They're kind of small alcoholic jellies, um, and they are genuinely alcoholic. Um, and they were looking to create a new brand identity. Um, they kind of felt stuck. They had some traction on social media and were being written up in magazines. Um, but they felt like they needed a new brand identity to really push the brand forward. Um, they have spoken to a number of design agencies, but they decided to go with us, semioticians. We believe because of our obsession with detail and meaning. With this project, we decided to try a new sensory-led approach, so thinking about the sensorial experience of the product, along with the story that they wanted to tell to create a really holistic brand across all sensory touch points. So how did we do this? Well, first, we, we sensorially decoded the product uh, to the point of mild intoxication. And then we looked at their brand equity, where they wanted to go, uh, how they were showing up in culture. And one of the core insights that came out of this brand was that they're a brand that looks at the everyday in a new, unusual, exciting way. I mean, after all, they're compelling people to eat their drink. Um, so how could we take this core insight and change it into something which is manifest across their sensory profile, uh, their packaging and their communications. For this process, we wanted to bring the clients on kind of, you know, almost at the ground floor, or certainly on the first floor. Um, and we ran a series of workshops with them, um, building up three opportunity territories which we'd created for them, uh, based on their goals, their challenges, the product, um, and their brand equity. And we worked collaboratively with them, building these up across sensory touch points before finally um, doing a prototyping session with them. And the result was this. This came out of one of the, um, one of the opportunity territories we had, which is called the real unimaginable. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that are interesting about this. Firstly, um, that thought about looking at the everyday in a new and interesting way, an unusual way, um, is reflected in these images. These are cocktails under a microscope. So kind of a completely new way of thinking about alcohol. Um, so not only is this you know, an unusual look at the everyday, um, but indeed, there's kind of a synesthetic reflection of that mouthfeel of the excitement of trying a cocktail in an edible form reflected in these you know, quite kinetic images. But what I think is really interesting is this idea of the pinching gesture. Whenever we would take these jellies out of the pack, um, everyone would give them a squeeze. It's just kind of a natural thing to do to feel them rebound in your fingers. Um, and we realized that this could become a really distinctive sensory signature for the brand that could drive memorability. So we wanted to create packaging that would not only allow people to do this through the packaging to get that experience before even tasting the pastilles, but actually it was kind of encoded in the removal of that pastille from the packaging as you kind of lift it from that, from that wrapper. And through doing that, we can build memorability 
Um, and it becomes a gesture that can work across multiple touch points. You can imagine, should this brand wish to create a VR experience um, or a smartphone app, this gesture is something which could travel uh, and be distinctive for that brand in that space. And so these are just two examples of how we feel we help to create a really synesthetic brand um, that you know, combines kind of the sensorial decode and, and the brand story um, to drive distinctiveness and memorability. So we know the senses can create meaning um, and can create emotionally impactful experiences, but we also wanted to find out could cultural stimulus impact the way we perceive our senses? Um, to do this, we created Chocophonica, um, an installation and experiment as part of the British Museum of Food um, and a collaboration with uh, Charles Spence at Oxford University's Crossmodal Research Laboratory and Bombus and Parr, um, theatrical foodists who do very interesting things with food. I'd highly recommend you check them out if you haven't done, if you haven't heard of them. The question for us was, can the sounds of culture influence the way that people perceive taste? So to, to explore this, we created four uh, culturally derived soundscapes, um, fantasy, nature, childhood, and artisan. People would enter the booths, taste the chocolate, um, and rate the chocolate on a scale of you know, how sweet it was, how bitter it was, how creamy it was. Now, it was the same chocolate every time, and yet the results varied wildly. In three months, almost 2,000 people took part in these experiments. Um, and we're confident the results you know, clearly show that cultural stimulus can influence taste perception or sensory perception in general. For example, for the childhood soundscape, um, almost everyone would upweight that creamier, sweeter, kind of just as you would expect, reflecting those memories of childhood. Another thing that we encountered was this idea of sensory journeys. Um, sensory experiences don't just happen all at once, but they can also unfold over time and, and kind of become a narrative. Um, uh, one of our clients, a major personal care brand, sort of asked us to explore this. They had a new product, which was a state-changing product, and they didn't really know what story to tell about it. Um, so we sensorially decoded a huge number of, you know, skincare, beauty, hair care products that change state. And we found that kind of narratives began to emerge, and, and we found, you know, six key narratives that everything kind of began to fall into. Um, to explore this for our client and to, and to explain this, um, you know, we, we kind of devised this structure. Uh, this is from a space called Alchemical Magic. Um, here we kind of looked at the pack and product, uh, the promise of this experience, um, this, this magical experience of something emerging from nothing, these vast sensory experiences coming as if from nowhere, uh, positioning the user as a kind of conjurer um, of these fizzing, foaming, bright colored, bright, strong scented experiences. Um, we use video montage to express the transition, um, explaining to them across the senses how these journeys took place before finally thinking about the end feel. How, is, how does the consumer feel at the end of this experience? And it occurred to us during this that, you know, this doesn't just apply to sensory journeys, but sensory experiences in general, um, that they can either meet expectations or they can subvert them. And in meeting expectations, they can, we believe, keep consumers in system one, in the automatic autopilot uh, Kahneman brain. Or by subverting them, they can push people into the conscious system two. Uh, and this has clear implications for both uh, product development, where you might choose to do either, depending on the product and the category, um, but also for retail environments, where presumably uh, the goal here would be to keep uh, consumers in system one autopilot, where presumably they're more easy to persuade. So what does the future hold? Well, we believe that it's more experiential, both in terms of the experiences that brands provide for consumers, but indeed for the experiences we provide for our clients. You know, running workshops where we perform sensorial decodes with our clients, um, we've done things like get them to wear blindfolds and earplugs to block off their senses so they can really experience pack and product in a different way and really think about how it's you know, showing up to consumers, even if it's happening for them uh, subconsciously. We believe it's more cross-modal. Um, we believe that it's, you know, there's a lot to explore with how senses interact with each other. Um, senses will kind of shift uh, you know, a certain smell might, might change the way that you perceive touch or vice versa, and this is a really complex arrangement happening between the senses. Um, and we believe it's more about understanding the local cultural context um, and the influence that has on perception. So what we and our clients need to consider across all sensory touch points is what do we want to say? How can we amplify this message through sensory experience? And how is it being received? And of course, what's the context that this is happening within? And if we really want to amplify these messages across the senses, we need to take into consideration all of the senses, not just the visual and verbal, because everything does communicate and everything is received. So through a semiotically derived 
understanding of the senses, our aim is to help our clients shape culture and experience with intent. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Matthew. I thought that was so great to see this way of doing semiotic analysis that's just beyond kind of analyzing texts. I mean, obviously experience is text, but just so really opening it up. So that's great and great for the theme of the conference. I'm just going to open the floor to questions again. I think we have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, did you come into a, some sort of agreement with the previous uh, lecture in the sense that in many ways what you said, uh, what you said, uh, what you, ju you just said in many ways is about recovering people's bodies, right? Right. Uh, synesthesia and, and, and so forth. Uh, I, I suppose what you said is <laughs> very, very <laughs> continuous to what we just heard before. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's down to um, good conference organization um, <laughs> rather than any <laughs> negotiation between Marcel and I. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think, you know, that point that sort of we are, we have a lot of um, kind of d digital demands on our attention, um, which, you know, for the most part are visual. Um, even to the exclusion of kind of the auditory experience, very often people, you know, will, for example, videos now, the videos that you see on social media tend to be subtitled because there's an awareness that very rarely do people even put the sound on. So there's a real reduction to just these kind of flat visual experiences. Um, and I think there is a pushback. You know, in culture, there's a desire for immersive sensorial experiences. Um, and I think brands are capitalizing on that. And I think, um, you know, brand activations are becoming more and more important um, for brands as a way to connect with consumers uh, and to kind of, you know, leap above the, the visual digital noise. You're making brands uh, semiotically fitter. <laughs> that's, that's our aim, certainly. <laughs> um, hi, um, just a question. You know, when we do text-based analysis, the frameworks to use are quite well developed. So we know we are on the right track and we are doing it the right way. But when it comes to things like sound, uh, and to sort of deconstruct sound and how the meaning is being created or through touch. So do you have any frameworks or concepts or tools that you had to invent to do this analysis and to be sure you are right or are you just relying on common sense interpretation? Um, I mean it's been a process of kind of developing those frameworks and also very often we will bring in you know experts within a particular field so we work with scent experts um, you know, musicologists and people like that, and very often, um, you know, it's a, it's a collaboration and a partnership with these people that we're using um, to kind of refine the way that we analyze, um, you know, across the senses or away from traditional kind of visual verbal language. Um, so yeah, it's been a process of discovery. I mean, there are aspects of the way that you analyze visual verbal text that you can bring across, and still, you know, we're talking about cues uh, and we're developing codes that will have a sensory element. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've had some great partnerships um, in developing that. And also, you know, there's the, you mentioned common sense. When we present this work to clients, as much as we may have spoken to someone who's, you know, a music professor or a musician, for example, in terms of sound, we still have to make sure that the way that we convey that to a client feels like common sense, you know. So we'll, we'll kind of, we'll go to the kind of extremes as, as much as we can of understanding what that sound might mean. Or, or what that scent might mean and what the kind of history of that is um, and the cultural connotations that that's connecting with. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, common sense, that's really what we need to bring it back to for clients is something simple and something actionable. And I think actionability is, is one of the most important things that we can, can deliver for our clients. Thank you. Uh, with the product that you uh, used as an example. Did you start with brand associations that you wanted to create or did you look at what people were responding with and then move organically from there? Um, which product? The eat your drink or? The alcoholic. The alcoholic one. Pastille. Yeah. Um, so that was really a combination of, of you know, kind of a assessing the brand equity. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, how they're showing up across their own communications, packaging and things like that 
Um, they were they had sort of quite s fixed goals of where they wanted to go. And actually, po like after this project and their packaging redevelopment, um, they've just uh, had a round of funding, um, and they're opening a flagship store on Oxford Street in London. Um, so it's been very um, successful for them. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's a combination of kind of where they wanted to go, um, their brand equity, and also you know the sensorial decode of the product. I mean, we did you know not just because it's alcoholic, um, but we did really kind of dive deep into what is the experience of this product. Um, you know, it, is, it's, it kind of blends the adult world of alcohol and the child world of sweets very interestingly. Um, and it was about, you know, wrapping those all together to then create uh, a brand that feels like it reflects both the sensory experience, the brand equity, and obviously the, our clients' dreams to where they want their brand to go. So it's kind of a holistic approach, I suppose. Great, thank you very much.